Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to the pitch portion of the Women in Tech Festival. Um, my name is Layla Wozniak. I am the business development manager at KNL Gates. Um, we are a global law firm um, that was partially started by Bill Gates Sr. And we represent all kinds of companies from early stage, pre-series A, to all the way to Microsoft. Um, so it's fitting that I'm here today, that we're all here today. Um, and um, we have 10, like Denise said, we have 10 incredible companies who are here. Um, the way this is going to work is they will have five minutes to uh, present their pitches to the, um, to the panel of judges. Judges will have five minutes to deliver feedback um, to the companies. Um, and then we will, um, we'll, so, sorry, we'll split it into two different sections. We'll have five companies starting. We'll take a short break for um, a panel discussion on VC funding successes and challenges. And then we'll end with the last five companies. Um, at the end, we'll have, in addition to the winners that the judges, the winner that the judges pick, um, we'll have an audience favorite as well. So um, you should go to the website um, slido.com and put in the code SV SVFWIT17 to vote. And we'll announce all that at the end. Um, all right, guys, are you ready to get this started? Yeah. <laughs> um, please join me in welcoming our judges to the stand. Um, Jing Brewer from Open Innovation. Deborah Magid from IBM Venture Capital Group. Marlon Nichols from Cross Culture Ventures. And Patrick Sagisi from DBL Partners. Um, OK. Um, first up, um, clear access. Please give a warm welcome. It's on. Oh, there it goes. All right, hello. Um, I'm Nicole Shanahan. I'm the founder and CEO of ClearAccess IP. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about our patent system today and how we're going to fix it and make innovation spread more rapidly between some of our brightest innovators. In 1790, our patent system was first drafted. At the time, the creators couldn't have imagined the complexity of the technologies of today. Smartphones, drones, self-driving cars, none of these things were on the radar in 1790. In fact, by 1850, the sewing machine broke the patent system. No one corporation could build a sewing machine without infringing on the patents of other corporations. It got so bad that it was known as the sewing machine wars. No one could even afford a sewing machine because the price had skyrocketed because of this malicious competition. So today, we exist at a time of patent thickets. And how do we get beyond that? This is a question that after seven years working in the industry, three years of law school, and a summer studying and passing the bar exam, I didn't have the answer to. So what I did was instead of go practice law after law school, I became a Stanford fellow at the Center for Legal Informatics. And it was there that I really asked myself the question, what is my job? And so I looked into the books, and I, and I learned a lot about transaction costs, the nature of the firm, and what it means to bring parties together to make a deal happen, to bring products to people. Ronald Coase said that transaction costs are a central determinant of how economic activity is organized. By 97, people had now analyzed what lawyers do. And, and there was a man, Ronald Gilson, who said, lawyers are transaction cost engineers. They determine the nature and whether or not a transaction can happen. So while at Stanford, I came up with this new theory. What happens when you pair a lawyer with information technology? Well, really, you have the new transaction cost engineer. So I've been writing and researching and trying to figure out an answer of how we're going to fix the patent system. In fact, 
as I looked at the numbers, less than 5% of patented inventions ever become products. We are missing out on so much because of this issue. I wrote this piece. The title is actually Transaction Costs and Legal Technology. But the editors didn't think that was um, stimulating enough, so they changed the title to Transaction, tra uh, Transition to Legal AI Will Happen Suddenly. But what I really wanted to say here was when we shift focus away from thinking about technology in terms of a lawyer's efficiency and thinking about how we reshape the economy, we are looking at something far more interesting. And so our job as legal technologists is to mimic some of the cognitive processes um, of lawyers. And here's the problem we're solving. The patent process is long, tedious, um, high transaction costs. In fact, 95% of, of patented inventions never make it to the market, leading many to, to believe that this uh, whole system is broken. So the theory that ClearAccess IP takes is that when we lower transaction costs from the end-to-end -end process of creating, managing, valuing, and transacting these assets, we create a better system. So with AI, and we've deployed computational logic as well as machine learning, we have the ability to complete most of the task of creating and transacting um, IP assets. And it's very interesting. What we learned was something very, very, very interesting. The Wikipedia corpus is about 2 billion concept tokens. So we thought, OK, at most, the patent corpus is maybe 15 billion. 28 billion concepts. 28 billion concepts in a machine learning program. And we've trained it to learn all of human invention, such that now we can answer really, really hard, expensive questions, questions that could cost you $75,000 to $200,000 to answer, we can do now at a click of the button. So what is the lifetime value of this invention? This is a homeostatic capacity invention in therapeutics. With a click of a button, we can tell you all of the players, the entire patent thicket. We can tell you how this thicket is organized between industry, where the funds are going, and where these um, companies are situated globally. We can tell you how closely related all the inventions are to one another with a great deal of accuracy. And we can tell you a 10-year, 15-year, 25-year, 36-year prediction of how this technology is going to perform. We can map the inventors as well. And finally, the hardest piece of this, this is a piece that I spent years working at companies and law firms trying to answer. Um, hundreds of hours of lawyer and analyst hours go into mapping this ecosystem. And we can do that now using really beautiful visualizations and deep learning technology. So where we are, we have about 180 enterprise accounts set up, um, representing about 9,000 assets. Um, we've enabled the $400 million valuation of a software business, and we've been engaged to raise a $100 million fund for longevity research. We're nearly 100% self-funded um, and revenue-funded. Oops, sorry. And think about it this way. A neural network trained with all human invention is likely one of the most sophisticated pieces of AI we have in development at the moment. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to interject and say, I'm so sorry, I completely, I was so excited to hear about all the startups that I completely forgot to have the judges introduce themselves. So before, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so before we give our five minutes feedback, if each of you would just kind of give a brief introduction about yourselves and uh, yeah, what you do. Sure. Hello? Okay. I'll start. So Jing Brewer from Accenture Venture, actually. Um, so we recently formed this group within Accenture focusing around how can we take enterprise um, clients that we have and marry it or match with some of the innovators like yourself and Accenture Venture is focusing in that. We're doing both the investment piece as well as helping to partner some of the smaller players with our enterprise clients. That's very cool. I'm Deborah Magid from IBM Ventures and we do something very similar with our enterprise clients but I don't write checks. So we have a strategy and relationship business. I have a, a global network of venture capitalists, and a lot of the companies they fund are like the companies in this room, and we do try to do business together. I have a question for you. Is the five minutes feedback feedback, or is it a Q&A? Because <laughs> I was a hot swap. <laughs> 
It's a combination of Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, um, Marlon Nichols, uh, co-founder and managing partner at Cross Culture Ventures. We do write checks. Um, we're <laughs> <laughs> Go to him. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're a seed stage fund, um, uh, primarily with consumer-facing tech-enabled companies. Hi. Good afternoon. Patrick Segisi with DBL Partners. Uh, we also write checks, uh, later stage and bigger. We're investing out of a $400 million fund currently. Um, and we, the DBL stands for double bottom line, so we invest in companies that have potential for huge financial returns, as well as in a, the ability in a non-concessionary way, that means you don't give up doing good for making money, the ability to have a positive social, economic, environmental impact in the areas which they operate. And I'm, I'm just happy to say, too, um, two of the five GPs at our firm are women, and not by, by intent, but just because these were the best deals that we could find. Seven of the 11 companies we funded in Fund 3 um, are either co-founded or run by women. So Urban Sitter, yeah. Ruby Woo. Ribbon, yeah. The Real Real, TheMuse.com, which some of you may know, and Mapbox and Off Grid Electric. And we're also seed funders in Revolution Foods. So the firm's had a long-standing tradition of supporting the best entrepreneurs that they can find. And a lot of them happen to be female. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, all right, so five minutes feedback slash Q&A. Um, Deborah, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'm very excited about this because um, our Watson uh, cognitive AI platform has a partner in a Canadian firm Ross. called Ross, yeah, which you I must know. Ross. I don't know if the audience does. Yeah. Um, they act as a legal aid uh, to lawyers, and so they are actually were hired by Baker in New York to uh, do bankruptcy law. Yeah. And so I get it about what you're trying to do. The thing I worry about is, um, you know, obviously we could use it what you're doing to look at things we could cross license. We're one of the biggest uh, writers of patents in the world mm -hmm. year after year. Yeah. Um, but I've also uh, been in a high priced lawyer's office in New York because of patent trolls. And so we have patent holding companies and trolls and I bet they could use your system too. So have you thought about what you would do about that? I have, um, in fact, I have been approached by certain non-practicing entities. There you go. And um, you know, my thing is is that we provide analytics. Our platform doesn't have a cease and desist or takedown mechanism. We're designed to show relationships and qualify those relationships. In fact, we can um, filter out a lot of the bad patents that patent trolls um, use. And if you look at the history of patent trolling, in fact, much of it was um, based on frivolous uh, claims just right. to shake it up and, and try to expedite a settlement. Yeah, that's, that's, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. My pleasure. Cool. Can you talk a little bit about your revenue model? And then also, can you walk me through one specific use case where it was a pretty detailed patent um, and you were able to uncover similar patents out there? Sure. So our revenue model um, is based on entity size. So our pipeline is law firms, in-house departments, universities predominantly, and now we're looking at investment banks and venture capital um, firms, although VC firms are a slightly more high friction in terms of the sales process, I'm, I'm learning. But um, so what we did was with the longevity research, we had um, a, a Stanford um, uh, physician who had about 35 patented assets. It was his lifetime of work, and he didn't know what to do with these assets. They were really quite um, interesting items, and I, I put one of them up on the screen, but effectively, we can take the entire portfolio um, or even pre-patent, so an invention disclosure. Our machines, because they're trained in the entire patent corpus, can read that, and they then go and look at that vector space. And then they produce this analyst report that shows kind of all of the um, uh, possibly relevant companies and research centers across the country and pairs it mathematically. And then that way you can see and have exposure to the entire landscape of this space. That's great, but then so are they paying you on awards? Are they paying you a SAS fee? I just to understand how that works. Yeah, so it's pretty much a, a base SAS fee, and then um, you know, getting to the revenue uh, just to keep the company growing from effectively what was nothing um, was you know, uh, a managed services vertical. But we're trying to get away from that managed services and try to get the technology to speak for itself. So really, the managed services um, funded a lot of our development. But is it every time when someone used your um, 
application? Is it every asset is equal to one payment, or how does that work? No, so it's a flat monthly um, subscription. Sorry, I should have been more clear about that. But when you said get away from managed services, I think we're all wondering what you meant yeah. by that. Oh, so the managed services, um, a bit of creating, so we they would pay us to kind of import all of their assets into our machine. So our machine manages the assets too, such as like a calendar or docketing system. Um, and then it, it ingests stuff from there into the machine learning piece, which is the analyst element that um, I'm, I'm most excited about. And, and that piece is paired. So there, it's an end-to-end -end platform of creation, um, analysis, and then transaction. So it's this full life cycle management. And, and they would pay you a subscription for that, or they would pay you for transactions, or in the future? So um, at, at right now, it's, it's a flat rate based on the size of the portfolio. So say your portfolio is 100 assets um, or 200 assets. It would scale based on the, that number. Um, and so because we're now saying, no, not 1% of IBM's assets are valuable, we're going to treat all 100% of those as potentially valuable. And they go through the exact same process. And because we've lowered the cost of doing that, that's now possible today. Okay, I have a question about your application. If it can plug into other applications like Slack, for example, a lot of times people are using that for collaboration or DocuSign, people are using that for signature. So is it your platform would do all of that or is it a plug-in piece available? So it's all um, online right now and if you want to share pieces of it, you just create a URL. So there's a share button and you get a URL. And so I can share with you a report um, or I can share with you a deal room um, or I can share with you an invention disclosure. So, so there's elements of being able to take snippets out and share it more widely. But it has to be shared um, in email or? Oh, well, yeah, so the pieces can be shared separately. And then if you wanted to create like a group, so Slack, you can create groups. You can also create these enterprise groups. So departments, for example, university, we just did um, a pilot for university. And we created different um, groups, profile groups, for the different departments. Great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Okay. Thank you. Great job. <laughs>
give to you in the, in the family's uh, waiting room. Um, parents fill it out, and then they need to go back to the office, score it, and then interpret the result. We save all that pre-visit and post-visit work for them so that your physician can focus on your child's concern and your questions. That also allows you to capture much better data. Imagine filling out a questionnaire in the waiting room where your baby is crying and the medical assistant is trying to ask you when's the next time for your next appointment. At home, you can observe your child in his natural environment and record that in an app and able to get that feedback in real time. And all that data has even bigger value in terms of prediction. We can tell you what, where's your baby standing. Is your baby truly ahead or behind? And do you really need to pick up the phone and call your doctor right away? What makes us better is um, pediatricians who use our tool can get reimbursed. Uh, up to $62 per child per screen. And by using us, we're also helping your doctors to be adherent to medical guidelines. So because pediatricians get reimbursed from health insurance, we charge them so that parents can use it for free. And thousands of parents say that they love us. 90% of parents who download our app will complete a full screening, and most of them will refer us. We launched about four months ago, um, and we have right now signed up about 131 clinics. We're in clinical trial with the US Army, looking at correlation with postpartum depression. We're also in clinical trial with the Children's Hospital of LA, working with the State uh, Department of Health in Tennessee, and also four counties in California. And this is just the beginning for us, because we are on the road of universal screening. The Ministry of Health in Israel and New Zealand have contacted us because they are proposing universal screenings for all their kids. There is no one out there who can do prevention from birth other than us right now. And this is a massive market, $24 billion just on screening alone, and that is just a starting point for us. We want to give to the healthy population, allow you to screen for those kids who have risk, get those kids who have risk into diagnosis, and then build out a complete end-to-end -end support system so that we can help every child reach their full potential. I used to teach developmental psychology at Oxford, came from healthcare um, investor background with the fourth largest health insurance company, Humana, and third largest nonprofit hospital system. My co-founder, uh, Jonathan, has over a billion dollars in exits, including the largest baby platform in the US. And our head of engineering quit NASA to help us add AI into our platform so that we can do predictive analytics even faster and better. So why Kitsa or Baby Noggin? Because we already have three exits and proven skills to make it work. And we have exclusive licensing rights. And we were able to demonstrate fast growth within a short amount of time. So we're hiring. We're also making the app free to download. And um, please download it and help us to help every child reach their full potential. Thank you. So, Deborah, so surprise, I'm a developmental psychologist. Perfect. <laughs> Here I am that makes on two venture of us. and tech, and I don't have a degree in either of those things. Um, so first of all, that was super impressive. Thank and you. have a lot of traction, so we were really happy to hear about that. So I'll just ask you a, a question from my experience in behavioral psychology. Um, individuals without any training make really bad observational uh, data collectors. And so I'm wondering, uh, how, how do you get the parents to do that well? Because physicians are trained to do it, but parents aren't trained to do it, and they're often not very good at it. So what do you do about that? Um, so that's why we use screening tools recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics, and these screening tools are designed to be filled out by parents. So it's meant to be for parents to, to monitor their child's behavior and done in a structured question way so that if they, can, if they say no, then the physician should be concerned. And we basically have built in, um, built in the scoring mechanism for the physician so that uh, the doctor don't even need to think. And um, if it appears red, they can see, um, they need to explain the result to the child, uh, sorry. And then if it's, red, uh, if it's white color, it's, it's fine. So I guess what I'm asking is in your experience or the experience of the people who develop these tools, how accurate do they tend to be? Sensitivity and specificity is above 85%, which is AAP recommended. Okay. 
and current current protocol is f parents are filling it out in office. We just change it to filling it out in mobile at home, right. so that they can ob observe child's natural behavior. Okay. Good Thank question. You. Just Thanks. to continue to what you're pointing out, the first thing that came to my mind is 23andMe, which. Um, all know uh, was shut down by FDA because the false positive and this in my mind is flagging red flag is saying that what about parents are freaking out prematurely because they're what's the false positive what's that percentage look That's like what I was wondering. and how do you minimize that type of uh, you know irrational uh, fear due to the fact that it may not be anything yeah um, so I think our tool attracts those who tend to be overly anxious already, um, and and the the the, the states, the uh, the California state and Tennessee state is partnering with us because they want to uh, triage these uh, conditions, right? Uh, triage uh, taking aside those kids who really need risk versus those parents who just have over concerned questions, um, and and we. Um, you know, sensitivity and specificity is over over 85% for these screening tools, um, um, so that's built in. But we also advise parents that we're just a screening tool. If in order to get a full diagnosis, we actually urge them to go see their pediatrician, um, and and we say that in the app, right right there. Um, so so um, and 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 because we sell into doctor's office, the doctor is also able to reach out if there's truly a concern. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm going to ask some business questions. Yeah. Um, so first, uh, talk about the, your, your marketing strategy, right? So you, you mentioned that you're working with doctors, but how are you going to get the parents to, to, to download the app and start using it? What's your plan there? That's first. And then second, have you considered working with um, preschools or yep. early childhood, childhood care facilities that you know need to do this kind of monitoring as a part exactly. of their jobs? Yeah, so um, we, we see marketing both um, B2B2C and also B2C directly. So B2B2C or, or partnering with the state initiatives or partnering with the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, partnering with insurance companies and, and so forth so that it's really coming from a place of credibility and, um, and recommendation from your physicians, from your insurance companies. Um, and we know from scientific research that will uh, increase ad both adoption but also the longevity of the app usage. Um, on the B2C front, we're also uh, looking at baby fairs, uh, Facebook, uh, mommy blogs. Um, our co-founder was employee number one at Baby Center, so we do have a channel there. Um, and preschools are, um, especially the public ones, are uh, mandated to do developmental screenings in order to increase quality scores. Um, so we could be one of those tools that allow them to get to get higher start rating, which means higher public funding. So absolutely, uh, preschool will be the next step. I have a, a contact that I want to make for you after. So let's get in touch. Perfect. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Great, thanks so much. Marlon kind of covered it, but in one minute, just uh, you know, it's an incredibly complex sales process uh, on the B2B side. The payers are not the same as the users. Um, typically long sales cycles selling yep. into large regional health organizations yep. like Aetna, Kaiser, et cetera. So can you tell us about any successes you've had to date there penetrating that? Because yeah. this is a great tool. It seems like a wonderful thing, but in order to be fully effective, it needs reach and just broad yeah. reach. Industry. So having worked in the fourth largest health insurance and third largest uh, nonprofit hospital system, typical sales cycle is about 9 to 12 months. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, but we're lucky enough to be working with the largest insurance company in the US called RGA, and they're actually the third largest in the world um, to help us um, um, channel our tool to their clients, which is the Ennats, the Kaisers, the Humanas of the world. Um, but we're also uh, targeting these independent practices. Um, these are typically two to four doc offices where a sales cycle could be as easy as a single meeting. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christina Jones, and I'm the co-founder of Court Buddy. Before I get into what Court Buddy does, I guess I should get my slides. I first kind of want to set the tone of what the legal industry looks like today. Every single day, millions of Americans are walking into courthouses intimidated, afraid, and alone, 
alone because they can't afford a traditional law firm's high hourly rate or high retainer. We call this group the forgotten. But on the flip side, you have 600,000 solo to small law firms who simply don't know how to market. In law school, they'll taught how to practice law, but not how to get clients. So what would happen if we brought these two groups together? With the legal industry being valued at $400 billion, by just combining these groups strategically, we can add an additional $45 billion to this market. So what is Court Buddy? We're a legal tech platform that instantly matches people with vetted solo attorneys based on the client's budget. For a la carte legal services, such as having an attorney draft a single legal document or having an attorney appear for a single court appearance. So what we're doing is essentially breaking apart the process and allowing people to afford the most important part of their case. Once matched, they can instant message, video chat, and call each other from our messaging app, and they can send and receive secure payments from our payment portal and also set up payment plans. So how does Court Buddy make money? So we have three different options for the attorneys, either a monthly uh, fee or they can pay per to do additional advertising on the site and in our newsletter and we also add an additional transaction fee when the client decides to pay through the um, portal. Since launching the website in 2015 and the app in 2015 we have reached 200k in annual reoccurring revenue. We have over 7,000 clients, 5,000 attorneys and we've made over 10,000 successful matches. So the team. My co-founder James is a former solo attorney and has worked with Fortune 500 companies, athletes, and solo individuals in cases. He is the one that felt this pain point when working in the courthouse. Um, I come from the advertising world. I created campaigns for Walmart, Disney, and SeaWorld, to name a few. And we have a talented team of developers and lead generators. So the competitive space on the larger scale, two of the major players in the legal tech space are Avvo and LegalZoom. Neither of them do very consumer-centric pricing, and also they don't have um, the patent-pending technology, essentially, to match them instantly. And a huge win for Court Buddy, we just beat out Avvo, uh, the American Bar Association, who is essentially the holy grail for attorneys, um, awarded us a legal access award. Some partnerships, we're actually talking with the Florida Bar. They approached us about essentially building them a court buddy. And um, we're going to present an option where they essentially take over the Florida market, which will essentially give us access to 90% of their solo attorneys. We are currently in batch 20 of 500 startups. And we just won the inaugural American Entrepreneurship Award, which is in association with uh, My Brother's Keeper which is President Obama's initiative for minority entrepreneurs. We are currently raising a seed round of $1 million, and that is to flush out a program that we just started in 500, which has been very successful, and we'll need to hire three key team members and also launch in five new markets to get to our next milestone. So this is Court Buddy. I hope you guys all can help us get legal services to everyone in America. Thank you. Thanks so much, Christina. Patrick, I saw you yeah. eagerly scribbling away. Do you want to start? <laughs> uh, I love the concept and, and nice presentation as Thank well. Um, so uh, building two-sided marketplaces is something we look at a lot, and it's often very tricky. Um, so my question to you is just could you tell us a little bit more about how you're doing that on each side, both on the consumer side, and it would seem that, and, and kudos to you, that a lot of the clients would skew towards underrepresented, low-income, or other people who don't have the normal access to the big legal firms, which is great, because they often need the most help. Um, how much of that is paid versus pro bono, and how are you reaching them? Um, is it just word of mouth? Are you able to tap into networks of some kind? And then on the business side, um, congratulations on the Florida bar um, arrangement. How did you land that? And, and is this the model going forward? We're going to go through state bar associations or other large organizations. Okay. So first, how do we get the clients? Building the marketplace. <laughs> yeah, so sides. it's the, the chicken and egg scenario. Yeah. And when we started, we were kind of going after both, and it, it wasn't working. Um, we had a, we were essentially charging the attorneys um, monthly, and so once they paid, they were expecting stuff right away. And in the beginning, we were still building it up. So that's how we introduced the pay per lead. 
That way they can sign up and they only pay once we bring them a client. So that helped us because we could build our network and they weren't expecting something right away. So then for the clients, um, we've tried multiple avenues. Of course, when we first started out, it was definitely word of mouth, business competitions, getting press. But um, now, honestly, um, search, search is the best because that's the moment when people need an attorney. Um, so we see that to be most successful. Um, now, the bar associations. The Florida Bar actually wrote to us. I think we were in our first year, and they um, asked five different companies to essentially write a proposal. Um, we are very lucky because my co-founder is a Florida attorney, so that was definitely um, helpful. And also, one of the judges that is a part of the, um, the board that's going to award uh, the company is reached out to us before presenting us to the Florida Bar, so we do have an in there. Um, since talking to other bars, they're behind with trying to get access to the general public. Um, there are a lot of committees trying to solve this access to justice, but no one has really figured it out, so they are seeing that we have found a solution and are, are starting to approach us. So if we can successfully do Florida and, and launch it and be successful, we can definitely carry this out to other, other states. I hope Great. that answers. Uh, Marlon, go ahead. Sure. How do you keep uh, customers on the platform, right? So if I you know, use your service once and I find a cool lawyer that's you know, within my price range and they're pretty good, high quality, um, I'll just have their number and, and continue to work with them going forward. How do you get customers to come back to your platform? So the, the clients that do have a great um, experience on the platform will come back because of the payment portal. Um, they feel like it's a trusted source. They know that the money is secure until the attorney has um, finished the task. Um, so that is one way that we keep them coming back. Is that an issue in, in like uh, working with lawyers? They because it is a job? system that they are getting introduced to a lawyer from us, it just gives them a little bit of, of security, mm -hmm. if that answered. Okay. Is your question around how do you retain customer coming mm -hmm. back? Back to the platform. Yeah. Once you, back to the platform. yeah, it's like um, you know, I, I've seen like a different area, but um, babysitting apps, for instance, right, where it's it's right. marketplace, okay. right? You got mm -hmm. sitters and you got parents that need need sitters, and um, they have trouble retaining <laughs> folks because once they find a great babysitter, mm -hmm. they just they go off. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So so I was kind of answering that. So on our site, we allow the attorneys to create tasks, and because they are individual needs the attorney has to create multiple tasks on the platform. So that is a way we try on our end to keep them coming back to Court Buddy. But of course, like you said, they, they could potentially so it's a, So it's more transparency into what the lawyer's process is and, and yeah. um, how they're going about doing it. Right. Job. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. So I have a, a totally different question related though to how you get the clients. You know, I keep reading about people, you're talking about an underserved market, people who are poor, people who don't have legal assistance. A lot of those people don't know they could have it, and they don't know that they could afford to pay for it, and so there's just a whole population that's totally lost. So what do you do for those guys? So there is legal aid if you're considered extremely poor. We're essentially solution between legal aid and the law firms. Um, so we do get a lot of people coming in looking for pro bono attorneys, and we have to essentially turn them to their local legal aid. So that's another partnership that's great, is we can kind of cycle clients um, who need the help. I guess a part of what, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. A part of what I'm asking is, there are, I think a lot of these underserved people don't know that an attorney would help solve their problem. And so they, they don't even think to go down a legal route. And so... Is there anything we can do for those people, or are they still tell them about lost? court? Buddy. Tell them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you. <laughs> oh, is my mic on? Oh yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Cleo, and I'm one female co-founder of Flock Technologies. Before we get started, let's see if you can guess what tech company I'm talking about. It was founded in France in 2006, 
It has over 35 million users in 22 countries, but not North America, and it's valued at $1.6 billion. I'll give you a hint. It's in the transportation industry. While you ponder about that, let's talk about transportation. It's a hot topic nowadays, seeing as we're on the cusp of a new transportation revolution. Uber and Lyft have disrupted the auto and taxi industry. The autonomous cars is only be gonna become more prominent and people are getting rid of their cars. But as people are finding more simple and affordable solutions to travel around, we foresee a problem that's gonna keep arising. What happens when these people that don't have cars need to travel to neighboring cities? Flights are expensive, train routes are very limited, and buses can take forever. Unlike other countries, North America lacks options when it comes to long distance travel. I think I just said that. <laughs> when we were looking at classified websites, we quickly realized that people are looking for solutions. In California alone, there's 100,000 students that are on Facebook rideshare group pages. But like classified websites, it can be very unorganized and it's not the, more secu the most secure solution for users. Now, going back to my original question, could anyone guess what company I was talking about? Blah Blah Car. Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> the answer is Blah Blah Car. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, Blah Blah Car is a long distance ride sharing network. They claim to have 10% of the population in France, and they're growing in popularity in, in places like India and South America. But what about a true rideshare option here in North America? Where the flock is it? <laughs> this brings me to flock. <laughs> I like that you like that. <laughs> Our mobile application connects drivers and passengers that are already going to the same destination. We're not like Uber and Lyft because we're only focused on long distance and we're a true cost share model. We launched Flock with a network approach to create the supply and demand necessary. We have communities on the app that are connecting like-minded people that are traveling uh, to the same event or that already attend the same college. For example, let's say you're going to Coachella, it's in three weeks. Your friends are already going to be there and you're gonna tr you're, you have three empty seats in your car. Why wouldn't you take Scott, Juliana, and Tiffany with you? You can sh listen to your Coachella playlist, make some new friends, and share the cost of the trip. All transactions happen directly on the application, which makes the monetization of Flock straightforward. The driver presets the cost of, of each seat, depending on the distance traveled and the number of passengers. Once the trip is completed, the transaction happens on the application, and we take a 15% service fee. So how big is our market? When we analyzed and the, the total attendees of 264 events and colleges, we foresee that we can capture 1.6 million users by year three. But when looking at a more uh, long-term projection, so this is when the app is open to all long distance travel, then we believe we can capture 10.5 million users across North America. My co-founder and I decided to bring the idea to life last January 2016. So within the year, we raised our angel round, we hired a team to build our product, we launched late July, we did our beta test over the fall and winter, and we launched our payment system last month. This is the projection. The projection. Um, so our, uh, our focus was to build our MVP and to acquire user feedback. We are now raising $500,000, and our two main objectives are to build our user base and build our Android version. We are looking for investors who are excited about the opportunity of adding another option when it comes to long distance travel. But we're also looking for investors who, are, who share the same values that we do. Why did we start Flock? Sure, it was to solve a problem that we personally encountered and know that many others do too. But the true motivator factors to put our idea into motion were the potential positive environmental impact that Flock could have on the planet, to connect like-minded people together, and to be a part of this next transportation revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Cleo. Um, Jane, would you like to get started? Yeah, sure. Um, so what's the average, first of all, great idea. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, what's the average cost per trip? Because you're taking 15% fee. That's right. What is the average cost? 
Uh, so to give you an example, um, we were looking at the Facebook pages. A lot of students are looking for rides from here to LA. So we calculated that. and. Um, we would make a four dollars on that. Um, so the driver would set the cost, and we have a sliding scale model. So depending on how many passengers, the cheapest that it could be would be twenty uh, twenty dollars um, for one passenger, up to sixty dollars. Is that? I mean, I haven't taken Greyhound in a really long time. <laughs> but how does that compare to some of the other options out there? I mean, is yeah. Greyhound is pretty inexpensive these days. Yeah, we we usually still tend like we've tested it out across a lot of um, different places. Um, we still tend to be around the same price. The thing with Greyhound is it will usually take it couldn't take up to double the amount of time depending on the amount of stops and just because it's slower. And I just who likes to take the Greyhound? <laughs> you can't choose a playlist on the Greyhound. <laughs> So um, I was thinking about why wouldn't I take you and Jing and Denise in my car next mm -hmm. time I drive to Las Vegas, and it's because I don't know you. Mm -hmm. So what do you do about that? <laughs> so we have what a do you few. Do about the safety of the passengers and the driver. Yeah, and you know it's interesting too because I remember when oh, I, I know her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would take you, Denise. I would so take you. <laughs> I think, you know what, we definitely know that this is going to be uh, changing the behavior of people. I remember when I first heard of Uber, I thought it was the, the weirdest concept that I was going to be getting into the car of like uh, of someone that I didn't know. And so I think that the, the mentality is changing, especially with the millennials. And the way that we have created the app is that you have a user profile. So you have your picture, um, you, have, you, you can see... Um, the name, you, you can look them up on Facebook if you want to do a little bit of research. And we have a lot of plans to incorporate, you know, having their Instagram profile. It's kind of like Tinder. Um, and uh, not to say, but you know, like it's like, you know, you're meeting someone you've never yeah. met. So I think people are starting to get used to that, but you, they're doing the due diligence. And we do have, to go back to like looking on Facebook, there's so many rides that are being coordinated right now on Facebook. It, we, we were really surprised, but we didn't have to say that we're from that school. Like really, anyone, if you're part of that community, can um, you can coordinate rides. And here, you have your payments attached to it. You have to do have a mobile verification. Um, so there, we do have additional security uh, layers. Okay, but I, you know, I do sometimes worry when I get into a taxi with a stranger or an Uber with a stranger, and yeah. they're usually safe. They're not yeah. always safe. But those guys are licensed and certified in some way. Even mm -hmm. Uber drivers are yeah. checked to some extent. So are you? Since you have a marketplace and some kind of official platform, are you exempt from any kind of licensing or certification? You don't need a livery for the driver. Or they can just do it? Yeah. It's the same model as actually Blah Blah Car in Europe. Um, yeah. So it's exactly the same model. And um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it. Can you say more about um, those risks? So uh, is, is there driver screening? Like you look at the driver's records. Um, who's responsible for insurance? Do you guys have any liability there? Yeah, because we actually fall within the cost of travel, and that's so important for us, um, we actually fall under the insurance um, of the driver. So we were not responsible for, like, it's just like so, a lot of um, so insurance. In your, pro in your um, onboarding process of drivers, do you actually take driver their driver records? And no, do we you, don't. Do you get proof of insurance? We don't, but uh, yeah, same model as Blah Blah Car. So they have over 35 million users. They they, they don't do that either. Um, so yeah, it's a okay. yeah. So just um, interesting model. I'm not as familiar with Lala, but one of the things in our marketplaces, and particularly I'm thinking about Urban Sitter, where you're yeah. matching nannies and babysitters with parents, the trust factor is probably the biggest risk for that marketplace. Who do you trust mm -hmm. in your home with your child? Mm -hmm. And the way they got around that was integrating social networks and you know who's who are the cities that have sat for my school, my preschool, my church, yeah. our soccer club. Is there some kind of a dynamic there that you can use to help validate the users and, and fix this trust question? Yeah, and I, I think that that's a, actually that's a good point in terms of having these networks that uh, whether you're attending the same college, if, you know, you can have a look and do some research and see if they do attend that university or see if you can but find their Facebook page. As a company, page. I think my oh, as a company? you is figure out a way to use that to surface. Okay. Not just there are 100 people going to Coachella Yeah. and not just the 10 people I know, but people in my second or third order mm -hmm. that could be safe. Yeah. Because I think that's going to be one of the largest issues going forward is this, this whole safety issue and mm -hmm. trust. And, you know, when you're in college, you don't really care. 
that much, but if you try to, I mean, yeah, okay, Unless we're going you stop to, and think about it. But, you know, it's like, yeah, we're all going down. But I don't know, that's how it was for us. But, but as you get more, as you get farther along in life, you start to worry about it. <laughs> can, can you also talk about how you defend Sorry, this? I'll have to cut us off oh, for the five minute oh, mark. Okay. Sorry, thank you so much. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, please welcome um, the fifth company. We'll take a short break after this. Um, Brainify. Hey everyone, my name is Diane. I am the CEO and co-founder of Brainify. At Brainify, we have been developing the leading time-driven AI engine that's been bringing our customers over 180% in ROI. We're also one of the battlefield finalists at TechCrunch Disrupt this past year. Today, Predicting what your customers will want next is extremely manual, extremely complex, static, and overall this whole process of you needing a bunch of data scientists. But worse off, this manual piece really limits you to segments that you've created within your automation tools. Most importantly, the predictions that are made are actually really, really bad. Reason being that they have data within their company as well as external. They're spending half the time trying to understand the user behavior within their own companies, but there's also other signals such as weather, holidays, or region-specific events that can really affect how you engage with your customers. And of course, the common practice today is that you would look at the analytics from the week before, decide if the insights are applicable for the week after, and then you decide to do something about it, or you use something that we call common sense. You decide that Christmas is coming up or New Year's, but other than that, every other event is pretty much ignored. Now let's take a little bit deeper, specifically into the mobile space. Marketers spend hours per week with their team trying to figure out how to engage each of us better. But the problem is they use these segments where actually 20% of people behave completely different from them. So believe it or not, not all females in San Francisco act exactly the same. <laughs> so what you'll notice is for us as consumers, we get something like this, a really irrelevant piece of promotion that comes through a push notification at a set time that the marketer has pre-decided a week before to every single person or even just being a female in San Francisco. So introducing Brainify. Our predictive automation platform is the single hub where you can bring intelligence for predicting your customer's highly dynamic interests and reacting to it to your existing marketing mobile, mobile marketing automation platforms. And it is powered by our time-driven AI engine. So instead of a static push notification, now the engine decides to send the most relevant piece of content or engagement method at the right time for each person specifically. So how exactly does that work? Our engine actually makes predictions for each individual in a temporal context. We combine user behavior, events, weather, region-specific events, and holidays to make the best decision. An example would be if Diane, and only Diane, is leaving work between the hours of five and six, and she's on a trajectory towards home and she's walking, and the weather is about to get bad at 5.30, this would be the perfect time to send me a push notification that says, bad weather is coming, why don't you duck into this venue that just happens to be on the way home and get a free drink? Seems pretty good, right? So all this intelligence that's done for each person is then ported directly into your marketing automation platform, meaning you don't need any engineering resource or data scientists. Today, we bring our customers over 34% lifts in engagement, and 84% of our predictions are accurate. Who, do, who knew that everyone wants to go into a bar when it starts raining, right? So instead of having these 50 really static predictions that a marketer makes every week, we bring about 80x more predictions, one to five per visitor, and it's all evaluated in real time and acted upon. The whole installation takes less than an hour, and if you happen to use Segment or Google Analytics, it takes three minutes. You share with us your data, you give us your credentials, and we actually have the engine push on our company's behalf and use the same success metrics you've always used, so there's no calibration needed. Today we make over 11,000 in monthly recurring, and if we convert all of the companies that's directly in our second stage of our pipeline, we hit around 750k ARR, bringing us to our goal of hitting one mil in annual contracts by the end of the year. So what really makes us unique is the temporal component in our engine. Being time-driven means our predictions go way beyond the traditional engine. Today, a common prediction is, if it rains, you won't go outside. True? Not necessarily true if it rains in the morning and the time you plan on going outside was in the afternoon. 
right? So this type of um, kind of approach to how to do predictions is commonly used in these different industries, and they're used very heavily in optimization. But we're one of the first companies to be able to apply that to user behavior successfully. But mobile is really just the beginning. We want to be the brain behind every single existing kind of tools and platforms that exist within different industries and verticals. And between our team, myself, I came from Apple and Symantec. I also sold my first company back in 2010. My co-founder, Philip, has a PhD in data science, specifically in the temporal space with a textbook out, which you can buy on Amazon, called Time Interval Data. Um, and he was a head of product before at Inform, which is an airport division company that uses a lot of temporal predictions. So our data-driven team is um, really excited for what we're building, and we come from products and intelligence backgrounds. And today, if you're interested in learning more, please come find us after the sessions. Um, Marlon, I had to cut you off last time. Do you want to get started? Or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Patrick, I, I'll let you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I haven't spent as much time in the ad tech space, but can you talk about how you're, uh, again, Customer um, acquisition and lifetime. I know it's early. I'm looking at your AR. I'm thinking, oh gosh, they just started. So, how are you getting out there in the market and and landing these clients? And what is it worth to the client? Like a roundtable pizza? Is it yeah. better CPK lower? I think um, it's you know, best. Quantifying it. Yeah, I think it's best to start off with that anything that has to do with automation is really focused on the beginning of the funnel today, which is sales. Mm -hmm. So imagine a company where um, they spend about $6 to acquire each visitor. After a year, their mobile app maybe has 2 million users. That means in one year, they spend about $12 million just to acquire them, and they have about 80% churn. So within the next three months, about $9.6 million is wasted. So if I came to you and I said, for about 300 k a year, I can help you earn back a third of that loss. Usually, companies are willing to try it, and more importantly, because we don't need any engineering resources to actually get the pilot off the ground, within 30 days, we can get the results. And like I said, we've been bringing a pretty good ROI right now for each of our customers, which then we convert into annual contracts. So from a life cycle standpoint, um, most of the companies that we work with, of course, because of the AI engine, everything gets better the more you use it. And of course, today, we only work with the most basic of scenarios, which is weather, events and holidays and some combination with user behavior. So imagine now we add a lot more to it. So ad tech and marketing tech is really just the tip of it. We picked it because it's the easiest to penetrate. I mean, marketers there have so many tools that they're willing to at least try it. Uh, we do work with a couple IoT companies and it's a similar concept. Um, we're not trying to uproot your existing automation platforms. We just want to be the brain behind it. Okay. Uh, Jing? So my question for you is, um, how long does it take to, for your platform to generate insights? Because you're, you said weather, events, holidays, and obviously, are, are you not taking into consideration of the social media data at this point? Is that in the future? So we actually began with the social, but what we find is that um, it's not always realistic. <laughs> so we tend to have people whose social profiles are not run by them. So we do utilize it in some sense of figuring out when your birthday are when your birthdays are happening and whether or not you might be attending an event. But primarily what we find with all consumer apps is that they're really affected by these external signals such as weather and holiday events. Um, and so we usually start off with that. How long it takes is we usually tell our customers that we need two weeks to train the engine, but primarily just for us to kind of handle the bandwidth of companies coming in. The engine, once it's training, it trains on its own and figures out whether or not these components have an effect of correlation. So usually during the pilot, what we'll do is we'll start off by running the engine, collecting data, and we tell you if one of these triggers actually affect your business. We pick one and we start off with that as the pilot. So we don't open up the full engine where it you know, evaluates all of these different data sources. We just pick one so that you could see how much of a lifter are you getting just from one signal. Imagine now we add the 35 different data sources that we have. Thank you. So my question is slightly different when it comes to the, the amount of time it takes. So let's say um, you get the data about the weather that day. So do you do do you pull the data once? Mm -mm. And so it's always running in real time. So all our data collectors are in real time, and it does it in uh, time streaming awareness fashions. Uh, so I, it's clear that you really understand the space really well, and you get the technology, and you get why it's important in the market. It's just that 
the idea of using context to personalize for ad targeting and marketing and, and so forth, there are a lot of people doing that. Mm -hmm. so, so we do that. Microsoft does it. There are other startups that do it. How, how are you going to compete in what I have to tell you is a pretty crowded space? Correct. So one of our biggest differentiators is that we are not the full automation tool that goes in and competes heads on. So with Watson, Infer, Everstring, all these different kind of predictive automation platforms that's out there, they're the full package. So one of the things that we found through our customers with one of the biggest problems is that there's 45 different mobile marketing automation systems today, and they all have something unique. You pick one and you're stuck with it. So there's some that's really good at weather predictions. There's some that's like, if you haven't used my app in three days, send you a push notification. But once you pick one, you're stuck, which means all other scenarios are gone unless you manually go and create something for it, which we just don't have the time for. So in our sense, the way we really differentiate it is that we are the application layer. So if you think about as the center, all these different automation tools are essentially plugins for our engine. It just feeds and, and consumes intelligence, but we don't actually provide the full kind of end-to-end -end solution for you to add into your app. Okay, thank you. What does that do for your margins? What does that do for our margins? Yeah. Quite, quite a bit. Uh, we have actually, believe it or not, no real UI. Um, we let the numbers speak for ourselves. So today, I mean, you would email us or Slack us your credentials or the messaging you would like to use, like bad weather, oh no, uh, whatever messaging is compliant to you. And then we automatically set it and configure it with the engine. And within a week, you should see your numbers go up. And no, because. I, that, so I'm asking a slightly different question. Um, because you're the layer that sits on top of like the, the hardcore technology, assuming you'll have to pay for, to use that hardcore no. technology. So we utilize the lev uh, we leverage their existing APIs and we get the API key from the customer. So in this case, if the customer were to do this themselves, they would use the same API with the same API key. So all we do is we push on their behalf. So we don't actually have to pay the um, mobile marketing automation platforms. We get paid by the customers, where essentially their engineers behind the scene. I see. Right. Thank and you so much, Diane. <laughs> <laughs>